I want to welcome Shankar to the In My Feels Punk podcast, uh, who's an amazing uh, journalist, writer, science correspondent, uh, has an amazing podcast called Hidden Brain, which explores the unconscious patterns that drive human behavior and questions that lie at the heart of our complex and changing world, has a ton of amazing books. Um, and how we usually start the show is thoughts, feelings, emotions, uh, beliefs, uh, negativity, positivity, everything on the inside creates your outside exterior. So my question to you is, how are you feeling right now in this moment? <laughs> well, I am delighted to be here, Lou. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, I, I listened back to a recent episode that you had done, and, and you described yourself in that episode as a piece of hollow bamboo floating on a river. Yes. Uh, and, I, and I have to say that for the last uh, few hours, that image has been staying with me, the idea of a piece of hollow bamboo floating on a river. I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm quite there yet. Uh, I, I'm, I'm perhaps a little more of a you know, type A personality. I'm not so much of a go with the flow kind of personality, but I'm so delighted to be talking with you and, and for the conversation we're about to have. Amazing. I love that you started with that. You know, because because I'm trying to, I, I mean, on some days I am that hollow bamboo and other days there's resistance to it. Mm -hmm. But once I kind of bring back the power that I have within me, and I'm also my own social experiment. So, you know, I, I, I can, I'm so aware of my feelings and emotions, and I always talk about them, and I can see the attraction on the outside exterior coming to me based off of those, those thoughts mm. and feelings. And I know you're kind of from a science background. Um, but would you say you tap a little bit into the spiritualism and the fact that you picked that out, especially kind of shows me that you kind of do. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the mind in general, and I think the mind has many different components to it. Uh, you know, there's clearly the cerebral, the intellectual, but there's also the emotional, and, and I would classify the spiritual as also falling under the category of the mind in general. We've we've done episodes on Hidden Brain, specifically looking also at our relationship with uh, with things that might be described as spiritual. I, I, I'm, I'm not particularly religious myself, but I'm fascinated by the inner world of the mind. Absolutely. Me too. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly studying myself as my own experiment. And during this kind of lockdown pr proceeding and, you know, leaving my full time position a a as a publisher and, and, you know, really good kind of going alone with, mm -hmm. you know, with my the, the things I'm doing and kind of, you know, you know, when I worked at the full time job, it was always, well, that was my salary. Mm -hmm. And then it's unconditioning that finances per se could could come from anywhere not just from your physical paycheck mm -hmm. so it was unconditioning and unraveling that emotion and that that feelings that i had and letting go of that and being like well money can drop out of the sky and that's kind of how i'm trying to operate right now <laughs> mm -hmm. well i i have to say i i admire people who can do that i'm not sure i've ever really been able to do that i am much more of a planner and a thinker and a strategizer uh, but I do know people who are able to really go with the flow and 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 appreciate life as it comes at them. And and I have noticed that in general, those people tend to be happier. So wh whatever you're doing, I think it it really is a remarkable skill. And more of us should try and and cultivate the idea of again being that hollow bamboo floating on a river. Thank you. You're a legend. I mean, I've, I've been diving a ton in, in, into your podcasts and. You know your 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 voice is actually super relaxing, so you could almost <laughs> you could almost do some episodes of meditation. Because <laughs> I actually just did um a twenty one day uh, abundance meditation, which was beautiful. I loved it, and it and uh -huh. it kind of you know abundance in love, abundance in health, abundance in all of that type of stuff. And my mind is pretty quiet anyway because I mm -hmm. I work on myself. Mm -hmm. I think that brings me to my next point. I mean. Is there any kind of relaxation techniques or wind down techniques or something you help deal with anxieties or, you know, because I used to be super anxious and depressed and all that type of stuff. And I turned around and was like, well, it's me. Yes, the yeah. outside world was, was, was enabling it, but I was enabling the outside world. Um, I'd love to dive a little bit on your experience and how you kind of your coping mechanisms, should I say. Yeah, so we, we've discussed several ideas on Hidden Brain, which I'm happy to talk about. But in my personal life, I would say that I try and pay attention to you know, what I sometimes call the, the three engines uh, of, a, of a peaceful mind. And, and those are really, you know, nutrition, sleep, and exercise. And, and in general, I find that if those three things are right in my life, most of the time I'm able to weather anxieties and setbacks. And when even one of those things is off, I feel I'm very easily vulnerable to emotional setbacks, to anxiety, to worries, to fears, to depression, to anger, to impatience, 
Um, so I try very hard to try and keep those three engines humming at all times. Uh, like all of us during the pandemic, of course, sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't. Yes, absolutely. That, that's kind of, I mean, what my wife and I, I mean, we have a 16 month old, so. I oh my gosh. Wow. I, I feel yes. for you. Uh, yeah, so we're, we've, but I'm, I'm pretty regimented in terms of when I decide to do something, I research it to the inch of research, uh-huh. so, you know, child psychology and, you know, the mental state of the child, kind of how they superiorly live in the now with every single thing, emotion, mm. and you know, all that type of stuff, which I love. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to live my life kind of unraveling the adultness in me and becoming the child. Mm. So like sleep training was something that I've always implemented with her. So she's great now at sleep training. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm sleep training myself. So, you know, eight o'clock hits, the baby goes down at 7.30, eight o'clock hits, do a couple stretches, a little yoga vibe um read in bed and then i'm i'm out from nine mm. o'clock and i'm wow that you. is that's fantastic yes and i'm with you on that on that now because if i don't have that then it kind of affects my day yeah you know the, it's something very interesting related to what you're saying which is that you know why is it that children especially small children are so aware of what's happening around them and why is it that we lose that and and and, and, and it's interesting like many other features in the mind I actually think this has both a positive side and a negative side. And and the negative side, I think we all are aware that, you know, we lose curiosity, we lose openness, we stop being present. All of those things are are clear. I mean, children are so much more aware and curious than than we are. They ask many more questions. They can see things for what they are. That's the gift of, of the child's eye. But there's also a gift of the adult's eye. And in some ways, this is how our brains are designed to work, which is, with experience, as we start to do things over and over again, our brains get very good at building models of the world. And sometimes what happens is as as we get very experienced at doing something, in fact, what it is that we are seeing and hearing and thinking is not the external world, but the internal models we have built up of that world. Uh, This is why, for example, if you're playing sports with someone who is you know, really an expert at, at, at the game, you know, let's say basketball or soccer, you know, you might have to think three, t- three for, for a second about what to do in a situation. You might have to stop for a moment and say, well, how should I think this through? The expert rarely has to do that. And the reason the expert rarely has to do that is that in, in the expert's history, they've developed the kind of experience that has allowed them to build the kind of models that regardless of the situation that pops up, they almost instantly know what to do. But but I love the fact that you're flagging this because I think it's one of the many examples I'm sure we'll talk about of things that can simultaneously be blessings as well as a curse. Absolutely. And it kind of brings me, I mean, uh, onto my next part, I'm actually reading a book called Atomic Habits, which um, I'm not sure if you've read or, or, or heard. I, I have of. not, no. I have it, not. It's amazing. And, it's, and it basically just talks about the conditioning of habits or unconditioning those habits. Uh-huh. Um, and even things of, you know, when I used to self-loathe or feel, you know, down and out or depressed, it would have become a habit to, 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 to think those things of myself. Yeah. So it's conditioning. Whereas thinking positively positively was not a habit it was kind of a a rare form or something great happened you'd kind of brush it aside and now Mm -hmm. I've kind of turned that need or mentally um another example which I think you kind of touched up on in 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 what you just said was you know we as humans create all these stories about Mm -hmm. certain situations which don't exist um Mm -hmm. for example I'm driving on the freeway someone cuts me up Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, I create, I, you know, I swear, I create this mm-hmm. story of that person being this, mm-hmm. this whatever. But if yes. I, when I actually break it down, I'm like, well, that person could be in a rush somewhere. They could have, you know, experienced a loss, a loss of job or, or feeling down or dep- And if we actually knew those things as truth, we would completely change our minds. And yes. I realized how many stories we create around every single thing yeah not getting a reply on an email or sending a text and that person isn't getting back to you or not getting a follow or a like or this or that um i'd love for you to touch a little bit on that yeah so it's fascinating because i think as human beings we are such innate storytellers that the moment we see things happening in our lives we can't help but develop stories around what it is that we're seeing and as you point out some of these stories you know they come to us so quickly so instantaneously someone cuts us off and we feel not just anger or you know not not just a feeling of you know this this was wrong but just this whole story about who this other person is uh, psychologists sometimes call this the fundamental attribution error uh, and the fundamental attribution error speaks to the idea that you know when we think about our own lives 
we're often deeply aware of all the context and all the reasons we do why we do things. So for example, if I am speeding on the highway, you know, I'm aware that I'm rushing for an appointment, maybe an urgent appointment, or maybe someone I know is sick and I need to get, get help to them. And that's why it is that I'm speeding on the highway. I don't think of myself as being a bad driver or a dangerous driver. I think of myself as being a considerate friend because I'm trying to get to the hospital, for example, on time. I don't extend the same courtesy, of course, when somebody else <laughs> behaves in the same way in, in the highway. You know, For them, when I, I just look at their behavior and I sort of say, what a reckless driver, what a maniac. And, and all of us do this all the time in our lives in ways that I think can sometimes be very detrimental because you know, someone says something that upsets us and instead of basically asking what is the most empathetic or compassionate you know, explanation for what's happening, our minds leap so quickly to the conclusion, well, this person must be thoughtless, or this person must be unkind, or this person must hate me or must dislike me. And you know, it's possible that those things are true. That certainly is a possibility. But I think much of the time when we leap to these conclusions, we're really in some ways satisfying the internal storytelling drives we have or satisfying the internal models we have of the world rather than seeing the world for what it actually is. 100%. It's kind of like the, um, cause I, cause I've, I've been touching up on, I'm, I'm super, like, I'm not religious. I'm, I'm, I call it practical spiritualism. So people can actually understand what it is I'm trying to do. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm, I, I, what I'm doing is I'm touching up on all the religious texts. Like for example, I'm reading solely the teachings of Jesus, uh -huh. not anything to do with religion or Christianity or any type of stuff. And I'm reading, you know, the, the, the teachings of Buddhism, even though they're really kind of, I, I, there isn't really teachings. It's kind of nothing was written down. It's kind of word of word. Right. Right. It's kind of paradox. Right. Um, and I want to I want to dive a little bit onto your new book, um, you know, Useful Delusions, um, which has just come out. It's actually my next book I'm reading. Um, I want to dive a little bit on obviously the, you know the power and paradox of self of the self deceiving brain, mm -hmm. um, which you put as a positive could be a positive thing and also a negative thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I, I should tell you a little bit about myself, Lou, which is, and you may have gathered this already in the short conversation we, you've, had, you've had, but I'm a deeply logical and rational person. And I've usually lived my life by the dictates of logic and reason and trying to do what is logical and what is rational. And what I've discovered over the years is that this often doesn't lead to the best outcomes. We don't actually get the best answers by always being logical, by always being rational. Certainly in you know, in our public lives, there are all kinds of examples of things that happen that seem completely irrational. And when you throw logic at them or you throw facts at them, it doesn't end up fixing the problem. Sometimes it can make the problem worse. Uh, the book is really an exploration of all the ways in which our minds cope with the uncertainty, the unpredictability of life, our internal fears and anxieties. And, and it actually speaks to the idea we were talking about a second earlier about our propensity in some ways to tell ourselves stories or to believe stories that help us basically adjust our internal worlds with the demands of the external world. Uh, and we can talk about a few examples of things that could be both positive and negative, but I think the, the thing that I have taken away as I've written the book is really a, a deeper understanding of all the value that comes from the storytelling. You know, certainly when we tell stories about the driver who cuts us off on the highway, and we reach a negative conclusion, you know, that, that's not something that leaves us feeling, feeling happy. But there are also lots of ways in which we draw positive, there are positive self-deceptions or deceptions that actually help us. Uh, you mentioned a second ago that, you know, you have a very small, you know, infant child, a 16-month-old child. And anyone who has been a parent knows that raising small children is extraordinarily difficult to do. Right, even even the easiest child, even the most pleasant child, can really be a handful at times. You know that the child loses his or her temper, is is hungry, is thirsty, can't really communicate with you of you know what it is that he or she wants. You know, wakes up at all hours of the night, wakes you up. You're frazzled. You're exhausted. You know, maybe if you have a partner, you and your partner are squabbling about how to deal with a the child. There are all of these huge challenges that come with being a new parent, and and of course over time. The, these challenges multiply in all kinds of different ways. Uh, one of my colleagues at an earlier job used to tell me, you know, small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the problems sort of don't go away when, when the kids get older. But, but I think uh, parenting is a wonderful sort of venue to sort of look at the self-deceiving brain. Because I think one of the things that happens to many parents, I know it happened to me when I became a parent, is that I thought that the, my child, was really extraordinarily special, right? To my <laughs> eyes, my child was just this miracle beyond all miracles. 
And of course, when I step back and look at it, I know that that must be a delusion. I know that that cannot possibly be true. It cannot possibly be the case that every one of the hundreds of millions of parents in the world are having the most unique child on the planet. That's not possible to do. But the delusion that that's the case with our children, with our child, with my child, is actually a really valuable delusion to have because that delusion, that self-deception, prompts parents now to take the extraordinary steps that are necessary to raise children successfully. If we could wave a wand and disabuse parents about the delusional beliefs they have of their children, not only would parents be less happy, that would not actually be in the best interest of children themselves. And so that's what I call the paradox of the self-deceiving brain. There are lots of examples uh, that we can cite about the ways in which self-deception can lead us astray, but it turns out there are also many examples of things that, are, that self-deception does that are really valuable to us, where our lives would be you know, deeply impaired if we didn't have those self-deceptions. That's beautiful. I mean, it, 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 wow, that's powerful, super powerful. Because you, yeah, because you're right. I mean, every parent, I, I believe my daughter is super special, and I feel, I feel like she's an angel. Yes. Um, but then again, I'm pretty methodical in, like, for example, you know, I guess you call it the Montessori approach with a spin. You know, obviously yeah. Montessori was like early 1900s or or you know 1930s, 40s. Um, but adding some modern twists to it. Um, for example, I don't know, I, I, I taught her sign language from birth so that she can wow. keep with things that she actually wants. So she can sign to me, you know, the basics and pretty much knows most of, of the, the, the single word signs, you know, the milk, the food, the sleep. Um, she counts. Everything is a counting thing now with her. You know, steps in a, in a playground are just learning tools for how many steps there are or you know, all those type of things. But that's, that's me as a person. But I think you're mm -hmm. right. I mean, because we have this, this idea that all our kids are special, but you can turn it on its, on its head as being a positive, a negative thing, essentially, but a positive thing, because you want to raise the best person that they can be, basically. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. I love that. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I want to dive a little bit more into, into kind of you and your family background and growing up and, and your experiences and what kind of led you onto the, the, the path that you that you are now. Sure. Yeah, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in India, and I became a, a journalist uh, really out the gate from college. And 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 journalism was sort of really has always been really powerful for me. Uh, and, and it's been powerful for for a reason that I had not anticipated. I always liked to to read, and I always liked to write. And I was a print journalist for many many years. But but the thing that journalism actually prompted me to do, which I had not done before I became a journalist, was to go out and talk to people who did not come from my own background or my own family or my own community or my own neighborhood. Uh, you know, journalism sends you out to talk to people from different walks of life to actually ask questions of them. And when you do this, you realize, first of all, that there are all kinds of really interesting and fascinating people in the world you know, many, many more fascinating people than you might have thought otherwise. But also you start to have a deeper understanding of how other people think and the wisdom of the ways in which other people think. Uh, I've, I've found that in, in over the course of 20, 25 years, uh, as I've gravitated more and more to science journalism and then to, you know, focus on human behavior and human nature, uh, the fundamental driver, I think, for all of the work that I'm doing is my interest in other people and why people do what it is they do. And, and, I, and I remember this from a time that I was a very young child. I felt like I was always someone who would observe things and I would observe how people behaved with one another. Um, you know, in school playground situations when there was a game unfolding, I would be part of the game, but there's a part of my mind that would also be observing how others interacted with one another. There was always a part of me that that wanted to understand why people did what they did. Uh, so in some ways, the marriage of my interest in human behavior and my interest in journalism are, are sort of what led me now to sort of be producing what, what we do each week with Hidden Brain, which is, you know, these deep explorations of, of human nature, human behavior, why people do what they do. Absolutely. Which part of India? My, my, my wife's family are from the Punjab. Ah, I grew up in the south of India in, in Bangalore. Oh, there we go. Yes. I, I, I need to take my, actually, I, I want to take my daughter back to, to, to see a ton of her family and stuff. Uh -huh. um, she's a mix of everything. I mean, I'm, I'm part Syrian, British. My wife's, full, you know, in, from the Punjab and everything else. So yeah. I love that cultural side of, of everything. Um, I wanted to, so I, I guess, I mean, I mean, I love that you, you, you're kind of, you know, so coincidences for you would just be a coincidence, not necessarily something of a higher power, right? 
I think in general that is the case. Uh, Lou. I, 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 tend, I tend to be sort of a rational person, but you know there are times that <laughs> things happen to you that you sort of have to stare. And you know, all, all of us have had these experiences. You know, you're yeah. you're 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 reading something, you know, and so you come across a really unusual word, and then somebody opens the door and says that word to you, and you've never heard that word before in your life, and you hear it twice in a row, in you know, in the span of like you know seven seconds. Uh, so it makes you sometimes stop to think. But but it is true that in general I lean to are reaching for sort of perhaps the, the more mundane explanations for coincidences rather than the more dramatic explanations. Yeah. I, I would use the term sci the scientific. Um, but it, yeah, because I mean, for me now, even, you know, I, I, I can, can kind of remove myself from myself and study myself and uh -huh. everything around me is exactly where I'm supposed to be based off of everything that I created inside me. Uh -huh. um, and I, and, and I, 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 you know, I, as someone who studies science and who's in the field, I, I put it to you to, to kind of try and do the same and remove yourself from you and study your life from an inside perspective. Mm. And only you know you. Um, and, you know, why things happen, why, you know, health, um, the weather, like there's so many things that happen that um, just obviously can't be explained. And I think that's, there's something beautiful in that. And I'd love, mm -hmm. I love minds like yours. Um, because it brings a different dynamic to the kind of, especially the, the show that I'm doing. And generally we just talk about feelings and emotions and, and the power behind them and the law of attraction and all those type of things, mm. uh, which actually brings me to my next point of, I already know the answer to this because, but I want, I'd love to know your predominant thoughts. Um, because obviously everything around you is your predominant thought. So when you say predominant thoughts, do you mean what, what I think about most of the time? Is that what you mean by predominant thoughts? Yes, yes. So for example, for me, it's, you know, it's my podcast, it's my businesses, it's my family, it's all those things. So that's exactly what I'm surrounded by to, mm. a, to, a, to a, an absolute microscopic detail based on the way I'm feeling. So I love to, you know, especially, you know, entrepreneurs like yourself and someone who kind of studies the brain and the mind and all these type of things. Um, you know, I go to sleep thinking a certain thing. I wake up thinking a certain thing, but it's usually the same sort of things. Yeah, I, I do. I do think that very much like you, Lou, I'm someone who is a very focused person. And so I tend to pay a lot of attention to a few things and not a lot of attention to most everything else. Uh, <laughs> yes. you know, and as, as a result of that, I sort of have, I'm sure, sort of really big blind spots there. You know, the, the things of, about popular culture, for example, and music that I, I really am completely clueless about because I, I really haven't spent the time to educate myself. But, but I spend most of my time thinking about, you know, ideas and human behavior, things related to psychology or sociology or economics. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about the show that I'm producing, uh, Hidden Brain, and, and ideas for the show and how they work together. A lot of the reading that I do is often intersecting with, uh, with uh, the research that we are, that we are promoting on, on the show. And, and then, of course, you know, I, I pay attention to, to family and, and to health. Uh, but to, to tell you the truth, there's not too much room in my life for very much more than that. And, and as it is, I often feel by the end of the day, you know, I've really not just sort of finished, you know, 16, 17 hours, but I've sprinted for 16 or 17 hours. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would say that I am very much focused on a handful of these things, but many of them, I think, revolve around the questions of the mind and how the mind works. And, and this is true, you know, so e even in my personal life, I, I've, I've found that I've tried to do a little bit of what you've just said a second ago of trying to observe myself from the outside. Uh, one domain where I found that really interesting to do is in the domain of food. Uh, I've tried to become a much more deliberate and conscious eater over the last uh, 18 to 24 months. Uh, and in fact, this grew out of a podcast episode that we did where we featured uh, a researcher named Paul Rosin at the University of Pennsylvania. And he said something that was really interesting. He said, if you pay attention to when you're eating a meal, notice how much the first bite of food gives you in terms of pleasure versus the second bite versus the 20th bite versus the 40th bite. And, and he said, if you, if you did this, if you actually paid attention to how much you enjoyed your food, you'd find the first bite was really delicious, as was the second and the third and the fourth. But somewhere around the 15th or 20th bite, the food starts to become a little less tasty. And it's starting to become a little less tasty because you're starting to be a little less hungry. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and for many, many years of my life, I think I ate more or less mindlessly. I ate just because food was placed in front of me. And over the last 18 to 24 months, I've tried to eat much more deliberately, much more mindfully. Uh, and two things have happened. First of all, I think I'm eating much better. I'm eating much healthier. But second of all, I'm actually enjoying my food so much more. And even, even things that are not particularly tasty, all of a sudden now are imbued with enormous amounts of flavor, enormous amounts of you know sensual pleasure. So I, I feel like this has been very good for me. This, so that in some ways, this is a meld between the research that I'm interested in, the stories we do on Hidden Brain, and my personal life. Oh, that's not, yeah, I love that. And that, that funny enough, that brings me to my next point, the difference between activity and action, which is pretty much exactly what you touched up on. Um, you know, consciously eating healthier, for example, the action would be, I'm hungry. Activity mm-hmm. would be like, I'm bored and I'm eating. You mm. see, the difference is, you know, for, for example, like the taste. For, uh, I use the perfect example of, I don't know, washing dishes. Now, yeah. when I wash dishes, I, I become the dishes. I become the water. I, I, I wash. I feel the warm water. I, I feel the bubbles from the, from the soap. I hear mm. the water running down the sinkhole. Like all of those things become kind of meditative. So I become it rather than separate from it. So it's not a chore. And that's, I, that's kind of how what I do with everything else. And that's exactly what you kind of described um, with, with the, um, with the food eating and, and, you know, consciously eating healthier. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say you sound like a more evolved soul than me because I, I I've been able to do this with food, but I can't say I feel the same way when I'm doing the dishes. It, it's <laughs> still, it still does feel like a chore. I, I'm afraid you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, cause, cause for me, the keys to happiness is, is appreciation. So appreciating yes. the fact I have water to wash dishes, yes. appreciating the fact that I have dish soap, and I microscopically yes. break it down to a level where no matter what my, I mean, you know, at the age of 25, I used to be homeless. I used to be this. I, there's so many things that have happened to wow. me. Wow. And I love all of those things because I like who I am now. Like, I, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not saying I love who I am now. And, I, and it's funny enough, I was on a clubhouse um, forum for the first time ever. Someone invited me who I do not know. Mm-hmm. And it was like a spiritual awareness thing. And I was like, well, this, I, I've always wanted to do it. But I, doing a podcast to me is pretty, you know, I can, I can talk. Speaking in front of people live, and it's not, I, I haven't done it. Mm. So I was nervous and everything else. And I just did it. And I, I was like, well, this is a sign that I should be doing this. And the mm. universe was telling me I need to be doing this. But I try and do all those things because it, it, it a, enables me to become them and be happy doing them. Mm-hmm. And B, just like really doing it, you know, mm-hmm. like, and some people, you know, like, well, you know, I've got so much to focus on. So I, by the end of the day, I'm going to be exhausted. And I actually, mm-hmm. find I actually have more energy come mm. in today because mm-hmm. I'm in it and I'm not fighting against it. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, we had a philosopher on Hidden Brain some months ago. His name was William Irvin. And he's a philosopher who studies the Stoics, the ancient, uh, the ancient Stoics. And, 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 and William Irvin said something really insightful. Uh, you know, in some of his books, he describes how when, when, when researchers go back, uh, went back and asked people who had lived through the, the, the battle for Britain, you know, so this is when, you know, the Britain was under siege by the Germans and bombs were dropping on, on London and people were sleeping underground in the subway tunnels overnight. And, you know, life was really hard. Uh, but when you go back and ask these people 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, what are your memories of, of being part of the Blitz, of, of sort of experiencing that? Many people actually had warm memories of what had happened. They remembered sort of the camaraderie, the friendships, the, the loyalties they experienced, the positives that they had. And, and uh, William Irvin sort of said, imagine that that's all of us as we're going through this terrible COVID-19 pandemic as well. You know, it's so easy for all of us, I think, to get caught up in the moment and feel, oh, my God, my life is so terrible. And some of us, of course, have legitimate reasons to feel our lives are terrible. Maybe we've lost loved ones or lost our livelihoods. But for many of us, I think we're just chafing with just the, the length of the, the, the pandemic, uh, the enforced social isolation, the, the limited number of activities we can pursue, the lack of social connections. All of these things are producing, I think, immense pain in many of our lives. But of course, if you were to project yourself 10 years out into the future, 20 years out into the future, maybe 30 years, 50 years out of the future, you might well remember, you know, 2020 as the good old days, uh, you know, and, and, and William Irvin said something profound. He sort of said, if you're living through the good old days, wouldn't you want to actually be aware that these are the good old days as you're living through them rather than just in recollection, in hindsight and in memory? 
Yes. You are the shit. I love that. You know what? It's, it's funny because this um, kind of, I had a um, Skid Row historian on, on the podcast who, uh, Dr. Douglas Mungin, and uh-huh. he, you know, because I've lived in LA for my whole life, uh, not my whole life, sorry, for the last seven years, but I've been coming here since I was like 20 uh-huh. um, on and off for work or, or, or other things. And what you just described was the kind of community sense, because, you know, you think about someone who's, who's not experienced that or the blitz or any of those type of things, you think are oh, the bombs and they're trapped down there, but it, it almost creates a sense of community, a sense of, mm-hmm. you know, people helping each other, you know, when you're so backed into a corner, all you have is each other. I think there's beauty in that. And he described the same thing about being on Skid Row. You know, we, we as an outsider see this place as one of the poorest places in the world, you know, yeah. d- disease and, and crime and all these type of things. But the people right, living right. there, this is their community. This is all right. they have. Right, right. Um, and, and, and you see this again also with, the, with people who've served in uh, war zones, for example, right? I mean, no one necessarily wants to be in a war zone. It doesn't seem like a fun experience, but people who've been through intense experiences like that invariably will tell you that the friendships and bonds they made in those situations are the deepest friendships and bonds they have made throughout their lives. You know, that you actually, you know, you you are born with siblings, you are, you're born with brothers and sisters, but these are the brothers and sisters whom you make in life, that you've chosen in life, that become in some ways as close to you as actual family. So I think there's something really profound there. And, and I think perhaps the the additional layer of, 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 uh, of insight is that perhaps we don't need to be living through a war zone in order to be able to appreciate that. That in some ways, the opportunities for social connection, for appreciating more deeply what we have, for being grateful for the gifts that we've been given, those are opportunities that are present, present to us all the time. Um, and, and it's sad that so, so often, so much of the time, we don't stop to appreciate you know, the gifts that we've been given. Yes. And I think that's the key, especially during COVID and us being so separate. Uh, you know, I call my mom every day over breakfast. She's in the UK, which is eight hours yeah. away. So. Uh-huh. And, you know, I, I call her and I'm like, hey, mom, how are you today? And she goes, you know, same old. And I said, as in, you're alive? Yeah. And then you yeah. see her reaction just being like, yes, I am actually. And I'm like, every day I have to remind her of the same thing. <laughs> but isn't, that, isn't, isn't it interesting, though, Lou? I mean, we, we live such brief lives. I mean, in, in the history, if you think about it from the scale of the history of the planet or the, you know, the history of the universe, you know, our, our individual lives are so brief. They're just, they're just a f- blink of an eye, really, is all, all it is. And yet, in this blink of an eye, we forget to stop paying attention to how wonderful and marvelous that is. The fact that we actually are alive, the, you know, the extraordinary miracle of it. You know, we, we stop paying attention to it because we're so caught up in the humdrum, the everyday, the routine, that we fail to see how extraordinary are the times that we're actually living through. Yes. It's because we're constantly looking down instead of looking up. Yes, that's, that's really wise. That's really wise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I want to bring in a, a section of awareness. So like, I think you're, you're someone who can kind of answer this from a, from a kind of practical standpoint. You know, who are we? And, and I, I question myself sometimes, who are we? You know, I start writing down my name and I'm like, no, those are just letters. You know, while I'm, you know, 36 years old, well, that's just an age. When you were younger, you weren't 36. So, mm-hmm. uh, so I'm like, I want to know who you are. Yeah, that is a deep and profound question. And I'm not sure I necessarily know the answers. I think I can give you the superficial answers. I can tell you <laughs> yes. that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist, that my name is Shankar, <laughs> and I'm a podcast host, and I'm interested in human behavior. But I think you're actually asking the question at a much deeper level. Um, and, and, and it's possible that in some ways, part of the reason we all keep ourselves so busy is that it keeps us from needing to, in some ways, grapple with you know, the profundity of the question that you're just asking, which is, who are you exactly? You know, who who, who are you? You know, if you strip away all of the, the, the jobs and the titles and the names and the relationships and the livelihoods, who, what's left? Who, who are you? Um, I, I'll tell you a little story that, I, that I've been thinking about. I'm, I'm not sure it necessarily answers your question, but it's something that I've been turning over in my head uh, in, in, in recent weeks. I recently came by this um, I was reading something, of course, many of the ideas I come by, I'm reading in books, but I came by this uh, story of of, uh, a a problem in philosophy called the ship of Theseus. Are you familiar with this, Lou? Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. So Theseus was apparently a great uh, Greek warrior. uh, And according to myth and legend, 
you know, he sailed to many places and, you know, conquered many lands. And when he finally came home, you know, his people decided that they needed to memorialize him in some way. So they, they, they kept the ship, the ship of thesis in, in the harbor, and they preserved it as a museum piece. I mean, they essentially wanted to preserve it as say, this, this will remind us at all times of, the, of our great hero, Theseus. Now, as, as the years pass, as the decades pass, and eventually as the centuries passed, the, the ship of Theseus, you know, started to decay, you know, it started to rot. And as it rotted, people would take out planks from the ship and replace them with new planks. Or if something else was missing from the ship or had fallen into disrepair, they would take it out and replace it with something new. And eventually, over a matter of centuries, every single part of the original ship of Theseus was replaced by a new plank, a new piece of wood, a new instrument, a new tool, a new coat of paint. Everything was new. And the question that many Greek philosophers, starting with Plato, have asked is, so given that every part of the ship of Theseus is new, is this really still the ship of Theseus? And there's even a deeper conundrum that you could ask. Let's say you could take all of the old pieces of the ship of Theseus, all those old pieces, all those old planks and tools and so forth, and you used all of them to assemble a new ship. Is that new ship now the real ship of Theseus, mm -hmm. or is the ship that has been using all the replacement parts the real ship of Theseus? And that's, of course, all of this is just a fascinating philosophical question, but the reason I've been thinking about it in the context of the question you asked is, Everything that I just said about the ship of Theseus is also true for all of us as individuals. It's also true for us as human beings. Now, it's just true at a very plain biological level. You know, our cells turn over and are replaced every so often. So, you know, you know, at a little, and I'm a little north of 50 years old right now. So the cells in my body now are not the cells that I had when I was 40 or when I was 30. So in some ways, I myself as a biological organism have been reshaped and rebuilt and you know, reconstructed over and over and over again. And I think of myself as being the same person. I think of you know, the me at 50 as being the same as the me at five. But of course, biologically speaking, that's not the case. But psychologically speaking, you can also show exactly the same thing, that there we've been constructed and reconstructed layer upon layer upon layer. And so when you ask the question, who are you? Who are you really? you run into the problem of the ship of Theseus, which is that we have been constructed and reconstructed so many times that it's possible, as, as you know, the, the Buddhists might say, that the sense of self might actually be an illusion, that we believe that there is a me inside here, that there is an I inside here, but it's possible that like the ship of Theseus, that I is actually quite elusive. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Wow. It's, it, yeah, it's true. I mean, because... I, you know, I can't ask, ask this question to everybody because um, but I, I, exactly how you describe it, exactly how I would say it, because I'm, I'm constantly evolving. You know, the, the, for example, this is how I, you know, people come to me. I get so many amazing messages from courageous people telling me all the things that are you know, going on in their lives and everything else. And I, and I kind of boil it down to we have to start being more present, as in, for example, you know, my issues of 10 years ago are not the issues of me now and for perfect example if i took a you know a picture of me from 15 years or 20 years ago i look completely different because i am completely different mm -hmm. so therefore we shouldn't i mean i know it's difficult because i know i've been there but to hold on to those you know the past regressions or the future which hasn't really happened and this is why you know practically on this podcast in my feelings or in my feels is you know most anxieties and everything else which we think are us are not mm -hmm. really us is based mm. on past thoughts or future thoughts of things that haven't happened. Mm. And that's one thing that's helped me practically as again, I break down spiritualism practically. Yeah. I can't, I can't be stressed about things that haven't happened yet. Cause that doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, I think that is so profound and so wise Lou. Uh, and, you know, we started with the conversation by talking a little bit about, you know, spirituality and religion, this is, of course, what so many religions try and teach us and so many spiritual practices try to teach us. You know, the, this, this is certainly true of, of Hinduism, the tradition that I, I grew up in. It's mm -hmm. certainly true of Buddhism, for sure. But it's also true of many other religions of, of, of telling people, do not live in the past and do not live in the future. The present is all that there is. Uh, and of course, that's that's much easier said than done. It's very hard for us to sort of divorce ourselves from the past and not think about the future. But you're absolutely right. You know, all of our, so many of our 
fears, anxieties, depressions, sadnesses, all the 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 things that pull us up, you know, pull us down or make us worried or scared, those come from basically not being removed from the present and living in the past and the future. And again, if you were to you know follow the the principle of the ship of Theseus, maybe the only ship that actually exists is the one that you have right now. The ship that's going to be the ship a year from now and the ship that was a year ago, they're different ships and they don't exist anymore and they are they, they haven't yet they don't have it yet come into existence. We just have one ship, one moment, and that's the now. Absolutely. And and again, practically, factually, the past was created now and the future is created now. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Oh. That's right. In fact, we had, you know, we had an episode with uh, a researcher named Ayana Thomas, uh, and she studies memory. Uh, one of the things that that many of us believe is we believe the brain functions a little bit like a file cabinet that, you know, I, I put something into the file cabinet and then when I want to get it and I want to retrieve it, I go back to the file cabinet, open the cabinet and basically pull the memory out. So that's the model that most of us have about how memory works. But But increasingly what researchers are finding is that memory is actually something that is actually constructed on a moment to moment basis. So when I ask you to think back to who you were when you were seven years old or five years old, when I ask you to think back to an event that took place last year, in some ways what you're doing is not retrieving the memory, but constructing the memory, which speaks exactly to what you just said, which is that even the past and even the future, in fact, both of them actually exist only in the present because it's the present that's actually constructing both the past and the future. Exactly, and it it almost becomes the idea of the memory itself kind of a reimagined rather than the actual memory. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Wow, which brings me on to my next point of a, a section on time. Because um, the way I live my life is I, I, I don't, I, I know it's a human construct. I don't really, it doesn't really elaborate to my life um, in terms of maybe with, a, with the baby and having the schedule and feeding has kind of pushed me more into time, but pre-baby, um, I was reading a book actually on um, speed, um, how we're always in a rush for everything. And, you know, the author, I was reading my daughter a book and, um, you know, you know, when you're reading kids a book, she said, more, more, more. And you're like, oh, I really kind of have to get get back to doing things. And I'm, you know, and then I sat down and I was like, well, what am I actually in a rush for? You know, you know, conditioning has put a a timestamp on when I'm supposed to achieve things, when I'm supposed to be a success or, for example, I work in music. So artistries, artists tend to be younger now than they than they ever have, because, Mm -hmm. you know, record labels won't look at you if you hit a certain age. And I guess it's the same for any field, acting, presenting, all that type of stuff. Um, I'd love to dive a little bit on that in the section on time or, or your interpretation of it. Yeah, I think this is a, it's such an interesting thing because of course time feels like the, you know, the water in which the fish are swimming, right? So most of the mm-hmm. time we're actually not, not aware of time. It's, it's something that just, that sort of unfolds around us. And we also live in time, we are in time, but we don't actually notice time most of the time, uh, most of the time. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is that we often are aware of time only when time seems to drag and when it goes very quickly. Um, so in other words, when it drags, especially we're acutely aware of time, Uh, And we sort of say, oh, my God, how long is this activity taking? You know, when I'm doing the dishes, since I don't have your, you know, your exalted uh, (laughs) state of mind, Lou, where I can be completely present as I'm doing the dishes, the dishes feel like they take an excruciatingly long amount of time. Uh, And there are other things that I really enjoy doing. You know, I'm watching a sports game or I'm uh, I'm doing some activity that I I love. And I look up and suddenly I say, oh, my God, two hours have gone by. How, How could it be that two hours have suddenly vanished? Where did the time go? But most of the time, of course, we're not aware of it because it's, it's not either sped up or, or slowed down. Um, I, I'm not sure I have necessarily anything particularly profound to offer in terms of time, but I, I do want to mention something that just popped in my head. Uh, I just came by a study. This is the, from the past week, actually. It was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, this is a study by the researcher uh, Daniel Gilbert at Harvard University and several of his colleagues looking at how long meetings take. Uh, and, and he found something really interesting that I think many of our listeners can relate to, which is he found that meetings typically don't come to an end when, let's say, a meeting is between person A and person B. The meeting doesn't end when person A wants it to end, and it doesn't end when person B wants it to end. <laughs> and very often, it doesn't even end when both person A and person B want it to end, but typically ends much, much, much later than that. And the reason, of course, is that neither side wants to be the first to sort of say, okay, the meeting is over, they don't want to appear rude. And so they end up staying significantly longer 
than they actually meant to stay. One of the good rules that I think many of us ought to institute about meetings is to always make sure that meetings actually have an end time in place. Almost when you start, it feels a little weird to do this, but, but to actually say, you know, let's have a 15 minute conversation and actually end the conversation after 15 minutes. I suspect many of us would end up having much better conversations, much more productive conversations, and also much more enjoyable conversations if we did that. Oh, I love that. I'm going to start using that. I have a hard out at X amount of time. Because I mean, you just made like, I, I've taken a, a thousand one meetings in, in, during my career and they never usually in music less than an hour. Yeah. Never, yeah. literally. Yeah. Um, I, I want to, I have just a few more questions for you because I, sure. I, I, I literally love your mind. I love the way you're, you know, you're diving into this. Um, I want to talk about dreams um, just from someone who, you know, studies the mind and everything else. I had this, um, and specifically like any reoccurring dreams to you. I had this, uh, when I left my, my, my last position, you know, I've been doing it for years. I, I signed some incredibly successful, you know, musicians and, act, you know, um, songwriters and producers and artists. And it kind of ended. I was there for mm -hmm. seven years and it ended in, in a split second. Mm -hmm. And then I started having this reoccurring dream. I, in my house, I don't like doors open. I guess it's, a, you know, it's a respect thing or, mm -hmm. you know, um, and in the dream, it was, it was dark. Well, it was, it was light everywhere else. And in the utility room or the, where the washroom is, uh -huh. um, was open and it was dark. So I let my arm in to close the door and hmm. something grabbed my arm. And it was like, all I could see was the arm. It was nothing hmm. else. I was pulling away and I was trying to talk and, and shout, but I couldn't do it. And then I woke up, but I didn't really wake up scared. I woke up like, oh, okay, let it go. Hmm. So to me that, that kind of, and then the floodgate started opening. And once I emotionally, physically let it go, opportunity started coming in and everything else started, you know, things that I, I just focus on abundance. So things started coming in, in all spectrums. I'd mm. love to dive in a little bit. Maybe there's a predominant dream or something you've had, you know, in your past or your now, or your, I'd love to dive a little bit on that. You know, I remember when I was much younger, the, the predominant dream that I would often have is being unprepared for a school or college examination that it's the, it's, it's the night before the examination and I haven't really studied enough and I don't know enough and I'm going to do really badly at the test. And for some reason, this, this would occur to me as a dream, you know, well into my 20s and 30s, I would wake up in the middle of the night in a, in drenched in sweat, you know, convinced that I was going to do terribly in some really important test. Uh, I, I don't know what that says about me, but there, there was something about me that felt like I was unprepared with, with, uh, with, with college and school, school examinations. Um, in, in more recent years, I think I've come to think of dreams somewhat differently. Um, you know, I, I think that dreams are actually allowing your brain to go into a state where uh, your brain can explore without, in some ways, the critical faculties that come uh, most of the time. So in other words, mo most of the time, for example, if right now, if you were to daydream for a second and start to imagine that you were lying in your bed and you had your arm out and there was a light on in the utility room and another arm came and grabbed you, you would sort of open your eyes and you would look around and just say, no, that's not the case. That can't be true. There is no, there's no other hand pulling me anywhere that in fact, that's not correct. Uh, and so what happens in our daily lives, I think, is that as thoughts and ideas and images and symbols occur to us, the part of our minds that's very logical and very deliberate and very rational and very skeptical basically steps in and says, no, that can't be correct. Let me shut the dream down. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what the, the value of dreams is in some ways the, 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 the hectoring mind, the, the, the part of the mind that basically says, let me be skeptical of everything. That part of the mind, I think, quiets down as we're having as we're having dreams. And I think part of the reason dreams are often feel powerful and feel meaningful to us is precisely because we're allowing our minds to roam and to wander without sort of the, 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 the you know, in some ways, the, the you know, the, the, the headmistress's eyes basically saying, where are you going? What are you doing? Let me keep an eye on you. So the, there's something deeply pleasurable, I think, about that kind of wandering. One thing that I have discovered in recent years, uh, especially, you know, as my life has gotten very intense, I've often found that um, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I don't stay asleep as long as I would like to stay asleep. You know, I, I wake up and, and I'm thinking about work or thinking about the latest podcast episode that I'm building or all the different tasks that I have to do that I haven't done. Then I start to get very stressed and then I'm not able to go back to sleep. One of the things that I've tried to do in, in recent um, months, really, 
is to, to realize that there's actually a, a window between the time you wake up and the time your mind starts racing around when in fact you actually can put yourself back to sleep. And the way to do that or the way that I try and do that is to actually try and remember the most recent dream that I've been having. And I found that if I actually try and consciously go into that dream, try and imagine, put myself back in the dream, uh, not trying to imagine a new dream, but just the dream that I've just been having, nine times out of 10, I'm able to fall back asleep in a way that allows me to get you know, my full night's, my full night's rest. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what that says at a, at a neurological level. I'm not sure what that says at a psychological level. Uh, I'm just reporting you know, something that seems to work for me at an individual level. That's amazing. And that's, that's so funny because you answered my next question, how well do you sleep at night? See, that's what I was thinking when you were, when you were talking and I was listening. Um, this, is what, this is literally my universe. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, just, just one more thing, just from a practical standpoint, I kind of touch up on this. Everyone has such a different abbreviation on this, but you know, your thoughts on life after life. And I, and I call it life after life because I, you know, I don't believe that when we pass, you know, it's the end because life is so beautiful in a sense of the amount of cells in our body, the regeneration, the amount of everything that goes into a human per se, let alone nature and everything else. It just can't be something that just goes away. Mm. Um, I'm sure you have a pretty practical answer for this, but I'd still, I, you know, I, 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 <laughs> with, with all my guests and every answer is different. So uh, I'd love to touch up on that with you. Yeah. You know, I, I think part of the, part of the error, I think is in sort of seeing us individual sort of any individual moment as being extraordinarily special. And I think we've alluded to this in lots of different ways in the conversation, right? So all of us can imagine, you know, the, the day that something triumphant happens to us as being a really happy day. But as we've talked, you know, Lou, we've, we've identified that in fact, it's actually how we see the world that determines whether the world is a special place or not. That in fact, that if we if we looked with clear eyes and we looked with with magic eyes at the world, the world itself becomes magical. It, it gets transformed, and ordinary things become extraordinary. You know that you know as as, as as many poets have said, you know you can see the world in a grain of sand, uh, but you have to look closely enough to be able to see the world in a grain of sand. And the reason I'm saying this is, I think when we think about whether there's life after life. You know, the answer actually in some ways is, of course, there's life after life because there was life before life. You know, all of us came from something. All of us are going to go to something. And in some ways, this is a variation of what we just discussed about the ship of Theseus, right? In other words, the ship is always changing. And at each stage, it's not that one version of the ship is real and the next version of the ship is not real. In fact, it is real. It's just real in a different sense. You know, I, I do, do I think that there is a you know, that my mind, the way that my mind operates right now is likely to still be in existence after I die. I have to say that I don't think that that's the case. I don't think my mind actually would be in existence after I die. But but I, I remember reading somewhere this extraordinary idea that when you think about all of the, you know, the elements uh, at, at the level of physics and chemistry that make up a human being, the vast number of these elements were actually forged in very, very distant stars, right? So many of the elements that make up the human body were actually at one point forged in, you know, very distant stars and, you know, in, in, the, in the crucible of, you know, these terrific fusion nuclear reactions, these new elements were born that were then spread out to the universe that eventually became all of us. Um, and and, and the, the lovely idea here is that, you know, in as much as we look out and, and see the universe, it's also the case that the universe is actually inside all of us, that in some ways we are creatures of the universe in, in the most deep and profound way possible. And I think when I think about what happens after life, I, I'd, I'd like to think that in some ways we go back into that universe from which we came. And in some ways that perhaps is the deeper reality, the, the, the brief window of time when we are alive, the few decades or years that we are alive are wonderful and magical, but in some ways our histories and our futures might be even more magical than that. Yes. Uh, Shankar, I, I think you're amazing. And I want to thank you so much for, for being on the In My Feels podcast. Um, super excited to, to, to read your new book and, and dive more into, into your mind. It's been a pleasure, Lou. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, sir. Take care and be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.